make for you all today is that timing is really important in what strategies we choose to guide our students' literacy development. And the way I think about this is there are some things our students learn at the surface level, some things at the deep level, and some things at the transfer of learning level. For those of you who are listening in Spanish, I suspect the person said superficial. Is that what was just said in your ears? I want to be careful that I don't mean superficial in surface learning. I mean foundational, introductory, not unimportant, as sometimes the word superficial means. Surface learning is around developing individual skills and concepts for our students. And then deep learning is when the learner starts to make connections, the learner sees relationships, and the learner builds schema for future learning. Surface learning is a prerequisite to deep learning. And a lot of administrators don't like it when I say that. A lot of school directors say, I want our students at deep learning. We have no evidence that you can get to deep learning if you don't start with surface learning. And how many minutes you spend on surface learning varies based on what you need to be learn, what you need to be taught. The last level is transfer of learning, where students become self-regulated learners and they continue to learn on their own, where they can apply what they've been taught to a wide variety of situations to solve problems. Now, I made this seem really simple. Learning goes from surface to deep to transfer. It's actually way more complex than that, but I'm going to argue that our literacy instruction needs to match the level of learning for our students. There are strategies that work very, very well for surface learning, but they don't work very well for deep learning. And I think sometimes, mistakenly, we apply surface learning strategies when we want to have students do deep learning and vice versa. So I want to be more precise in my own teaching about matching my strategies to the level of learning for my students. We'll start with surface learning. Surface learning is important. Maybe I'll give you an example now instead. Let's go back. Have you all heard of graphic organizers and concept maps? Common, right? They have a significant, huge research base behind them. The effect size for graphic organizers is 0 0.60, very strong. But if you actually read the research on graphic organizers, they work for deep learning. They don't work for surface learning. You don't know anything yet. It's hard to organize that stuff. If you don't have concepts in your mind, you can't graph them yet. And so in the beginning of a unit, we don't want to give students graphic organizers on a brand new unit, say, on the solar system, if they don't know enough yet, because they will end up copying what the teacher puts on the document camera. And copying what a teacher puts on the document camera is not deep learning. It's replication or compliance. So that's a quick example. Surface learning is important. We don't want to discourage this. I was uh, at a conference, and one of these school superintendents, he had a hundred and some schools under his responsibility. He said to me, I don't want you to spend so much time on surface learning. I want our students swimming in the deep end of depth of knowledge. And I said, I'm an English teacher. I will go with your analogy. They are going to drown there <laughs> without sufficient surface learning. Now, I do worry that a lot of places we spend way too much time on surface learning. I was in Alaska in January. It's very cold there in, in January. I was at a conference, and a teacher came up to me at break and said, every strategy you put up for surface learning is what I have done all year so far. And I said to her, lucky you, there's still half a year to go. You can switch and go deep learning with students. Here are some of the more than 20 literacy strategies that have research evidence that they work at the surface level. And there's nothing wrong with these. Some of you see vocabulary up there. If I am teaching you vocabulary, 
it will only ever be at the surface level. The only way to move vocabulary to the deep level is when students start using the words themselves in their own speech and in their own writing. As long as I'm teaching words, and it could be the coolest vocabulary lesson ever. I could get up here and do interpretive dance to your vocabulary words, right? And it's the coolest lesson ever. But if I'm doing the work, it's only going to be surface level. There's nothing wrong with surface learning as long as we don't leave our students there. A couple I want to highlight for you today. The first is reading volume. How many words are students read across a school year? The next three slides are correlational research, not causation research. But there are tens of thousands of kids worldwide in this database on reading volume. And it appears that if you read 20 minutes a day outside of the school day, you will read 1.8 million words, and you will score in the 90th percentile on whatever assessment your school system uses. And there's data from China, Australia, England, the US, there's all kinds of places in this database. If you read enough, you score really well. In much smaller studies, if you read 20 minutes a day outside of the school day, you will learn on average 2,700 new words from all forms of instruction. The reading that students do allows them to practice the words you've been teaching them. Student B, on uh, another hand, <clears throat> reads on average five minutes a day outside of the school day. The volume drops to 282,000 words, and the student scores in the 50th percentile. The teacher is still working very hard, but the words are not sticking because the student doesn't engage in sufficient practice. I think reading is the practice effect. I don't think you actually learn all the words from reading. I think you learn the words from your teacher and from your peers. But you remember them because you practice them over and over and over again as you read. Student C reads on average one minute a day. The volume drops to 8,000 words read over the entire course of the year. The student scores in the bottom 10 percentile and learns zero new words from any form of instruction over the school year. We went from 2,700 words. This is about 800 words learned at five minutes a day for a year, down to zero words learned over the course of the year. The teacher is still working very hard, but none of the vocabulary is sticking because the student does engage in sufficient practice. It's all surface learning. Getting kids to read builds their background knowledge and builds their vocabulary. I suspect you all have a lot of students who just don't read at home. So we did a big study last summer. How could we increase the volume that students read at home? What does the research in education say about the ways teachers can raise reading volume? Here is what did not work. Putting students on a computer and giving them points for reading. That's, there's not evidence for that. Having pizza parties for reading a lot of books did not change their reading habits. Having the school director kiss a pig if they read 10,000 books <laughs> did not work although it's been tried and studied, bizarrely. There are only four things in the research world that say they have a chance of rating, raising reading volume at home. <clears throat> Number one, students need access to things to read. If you go home to your house, to your apartment, and there is nothing to read at home, even if you wanted to read, you can't. Access is important. Unfortunately, some teachers have created classroom museums and not classroom libraries. Do you know the difference between a museum and a library? You can look, but don't touch. I want the books going home with kids because they have a chance of reading them. And I recognize 
Some of the books will be damaged and lost and stolen. I get that. That is part of the cost of doing this business. We will have to replace books. I wish they wouldn't get damaged, but they are paper, they are not stone, so some of them are going to be damaged, and we have to supply teachers with classroom library materials. The research on this says that you must have a minimum, the lowest number I can find in the research, a minimum of 22 books per child per classroom in the classroom library. Most people recommend, most studies that have studied reading volumes say 50 books per kid per classroom. But there was one study that showed 22 books per kid per classroom was enough. In addition to the classroom library, the school library should have on average 12,000 additional titles for kids. Most of you probably don't have that at your disposal. And that's part of the reason kids aren't reading a lot. There just aren't enough access points. Number two, not always a popular um, piece of research, choice matters to raise at-home reading. If I tell you fourth graders or ninth graders, you must read this book tonight, your reading volume will probably decrease. I will probably see students going on Spark Notes and Wikipedia to find out what happens in Act Two of Hamlet because they didn't choose to read that. There is nothing wrong with studying all those books at school. There's nothing wrong with that, with the teacher present to scaffold and guide. But if you want to raise the reading volume, you have to give students some choice in the reading matter. The research on this has two big parts to it. Number one is free choice. Here's a library, pick whatever you want. The other is called constrained choice. Here are 20 titles, you have to pick something off of this list. Both of those options have evidence for increasing volume. It does not have to be anything goes. We could be learning about rainforest, or we could be learning about global warming, we could be learning about something and have a list of titles. We could be learning about robotics, as we were just hearing about. Here's a list of titles. Or it can be, here's a library, pick whatever you want to read. But if you, if you don't increase choice, you run the risk of not raising volume. Number three in the research says, students want to talk at school about the things they read at home. They want time during the day to discuss what they've been reading at home. There are book clubs and literature circles but if all the students in that group have read a different book, there's a protocol called Save the Last Word for Me. You can Google it, it's all over. It was designed by the American Library Association. They created this protocol. It's very easy to find. Save the Last Word for Me. It's a protocol to, to teach students to talk to each other when they've read different texts. And the last piece of research says, Teachers need to talk about and recommend books to their students on a daily basis. The researchers call this blessing books, that you stand up and you bless books in front of your students. Give a book talk. The evidence says five books a day. You bless five books a day. Here's a book about vampires. It's really interesting because of blah, blah, blah. Here's a book about this. Here's a book about this. You do five quick book talks a day. You get students to talk about what they're reading at home. You let them choose what they're gonna read, and you actually let them have access to those books, you might change the reading volume of your students. I didn't say this was easy, and I didn't say this was inexpensive, but if you care about the volume of reading your students do, these are the only things we find in research that can change the impact that we have. Here's an example of a book talk. Where are we? Oops, wrong button. Here's an example of a book talk. This book came out in December. It is for teenagers. So I know some of you teach elementary school, but I currently teach grade nine. This guy, Jay Asher, wrote a book called 13 Reasons Why. Some of you know that book. It's outside right now on the shelves. Well, it might not be there. It was there this morning on the shelves. It is a suicide book. It was published 10 years ago. It's hard for me to believe that. Nobody worried about it when it came out 10 years ago until Netflix made the miniseries. And then the world freaked out about it, right? Even though the book is 10 years old. 
Well, Jay had not written another book for 10 years. So when this book came out, all of us wanted to read it. What was Jay going to say next? So it became a bestseller on the first day it came out. It's about this girl. She lives in the state of Oregon in the United States. Her family grows Christmas trees for a living. They take her out of school for a month every year. They move to Northern California, and they sell Christmas trees on a Christmas tree parking lot. She's a good girl. She Skypes her teachers every day to keep up with her work. She's taking French and Algebra two and all these other things. And she meets the town's local bad boy. And she falls in love with him. He has done a couple things wrong, but from my perspective working in the inner city, he's not that bad of a boy. Like, his crime is he talks back to teachers. For me, that's not a big crime. But anyway, so he's there. He also raises money, saves money for families that can't afford Christmas trees because he remembers his father who left them when he was seven. And the most fond memory of dad was going to buy the Christmas tree, bring it home, and decorate it. And he wants to provide that for poor families. So they meet at the Christmas tree lot. They fall in love. He buys one of those heart necklaces that's broken in half, and he gives her half of it. And then he actually wears the other half, which is a lot of pressure for the boys in the room, because we don't want to wear those necklaces. I read this book in December with four girls in my first period class. They really wanted to read this book after a book talk, and they begged me to be part of this book. It is the most dreadful love story that I've read in a really long time. <laughs> and those girls loved this book. If Sebastian could be more like him, I would be so happy. <laughs> they loved this book. So if you love teenage romance, this is the book for you. It's Sign You Up. There's this book. It's very popular in the U.S. right now. It is a very painful book that's going around the country right now where I live. It's about this girl on the cover. She goes to a party. There are drugs and alcohol at this party. So page one, fair warning, marijuana and alcohol at a teenage party. If that doesn't work in your school, don't buy this book. <laughs> drugs and alcohol on the first page. This girl does not want to be part of this party. She sees a kid she remembers from elementary school. She hasn't seen him for years. He offers to give her a ride home, and then he's going to go back to the party. On the way home, they are pulled over by the police. He gets out of the car, complying with the police officer. The officer says, where's your driver's license? He reaches in the car to grab his driver's license, and the police officer shoots and kills him on the spot. And she witnesses it. This is a police brutality against the black community in the United States. A very, very raw issue for us to talk about. About why are the police officers who are supposed to protect us harming certain people in our society. What I appreciate about this book, it is as raw on the first page as it is on the last page. This author does not tie it up neatly and make the issue go away. It is a painful book looking at an issue that's happening in the United States to a lot of our students. How many of you want to read this book now that I talked about it? How many of you want to read this book now that I talked about it? It's all right, you're allowed. Right? Book talks can introduce you to books that you may not have heard of. Book talks can invite you into being a reader. If I spend three or four minutes of a class period talking about five books, and then I give my students six or seven minutes to talk about what they are reading, and I give them access to those books and choices, volume goes up. What if books were unavoidable as students glanced around the room. This is easy to do. You can change this Monday. Do your students know that you know books? Do your students know that you care about books? Do your students know they have choices in their reading? Do your students know there are interesting ideas out there in books? That's surface learning. It's not going to get you great scores on the assessment, but it might change a life in the terms of vocabulary. 
and a lifelong habit of reading. It's a couple minutes of your day. Another surface learning tool we have is teacher modeling, opening up our brains and sharing our thinking with our students. Modeling is an important part of a teaching process, yet it's surface learning. It is not deep learning. In the world of reading, we have four choices for teacher modeling. We have four things that we can model for students. For example, we can model our own comprehension. You all know these words for reading? These are familiar terms to you? So I'm not going to talk about the terms. I want to talk about what it sounds like to model for students. Modeling should start with I, not you, and not we. I can make the following prediction. I can visualize this in my mind. Human beings listen differently when the speaker says I. It's called empathetic listening. That's why counselors use it, and that's why conflict resolution uses I statements. It causes the learner to listen in a different way. If you just say, I can visualize this, the learner knows you know how to do it, but the learner doesn't yet know how to do it. You have to also include the metacognition behind it. I can visualize this in my mind because of these three words. I can make the following prediction because the author told me X. That's what modeling sounds like. And I know it's awkward for a lot of you. You're not used to saying I, I, I. Some of us have been trained to say we, 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 or when you predict and when you summarize. But students don't listen in the way they are supposed to listen unless you turn it to an I example. These are brief examples of how you solved some problem in the world of reading. Remember that thinking is invisible. The only thing we have is talking about our thinking. Second thing you can model in the world of reading is word solving. When you come to an unknown word, what do you do? I hope the answer is not skip it, because readers work to figure out the meaning of words when they read. One of the things we can use is context clues. They work on average 50% of the time. There are misdirective clues, there are non-directive clues, but sometimes the writer has included clues to help us understand what a word means. See, word solving is different than vocabulary instruction. When I'm teaching you words, I'm focusing on the definitions, what the words mean. But when I'm teaching you word solving, I'm teaching you how to figure out unknown words. Second, you could use word parts. The morphology of words, the prefixes, suffixes, roots, bases, cognates. And since most of you have English-Spanish as your languages, not all the cognates work, right? What's the cognate for embarrassed? Embarazada. Sound right? Hmm? Sounds right. Not right, correct? So we have to be careful of those cognates, and our students have to learn them. Just because the words sound similar might not be a cognate. It might be a false cognate. And they should look at prefix, suffix, roots, and bases. The English language is filled with prefix, suffix, roots, and bases. It's how we think about com composing and decomposing words. When those two systems, context clues and word parts, don't work, we use our resources. We look it up, we ask other people, etc. We actively work to make sense of the text. Third, we can model for our students how, to, how the text worked on its inside. We call that text structures. In Western writing, there are common structures that writers use. Writers in informational text or expository text use five major types. In narrative text, they use a story grammar. There's a knowledge base about how writers write in Western society. And our students have to come to terms with those structures. Internal x-raying the bones of how a piece of text works. The last thing we can model for our students are those text features. 
that were designed to improve comprehension. Graphs, charts, diagrams, figures, bold words are also becoming more and more common on the assessments that students see. We're seeing more graphs and charts and diagrams because they are good tools to determine proficiency. So I gave you four things you could model for students. You can model comprehension. You can model word solving. You can model text structures. And you can model text features. So I'm going to give you an example of a piece of text. I'm going to give you an example of my modeling. And then I'm going to ask you what you might also model for students. The text I have chosen is from an international magazine called Discover. Discover publishes scientific, anthropological, um, historical kinds of pieces of text. And the one I've chosen is titled, What Happened to Phineas? Are the interpreters ready for this? Attend the tale of Phineas Gage, honest well liked by friends and fellow workers on the Rutland and Burlington Railroads. Gage was a young man of exemplary character and promise until one day in September, 1848. While tamping down the blasting powder for a dynamite charge, Gage inadvertently sparked an explosion. The inch-thick tamping rod rocketed through his cheek, obliterating his left eye on its way through his brain and out the top of his skull. So I can make a prediction from this paragraph. I predict this guy, Phineas, is going to die from this injury. I watch a lot of TV. CSI is one of my favorite shows ever. I have watched CSI in every city that it exists. I'm very into CSI. Now, in CSI, if something goes through your brain, you die. So TV has taught me that penetrating brain injuries are fatal. So I think he is going to die. Now, for your partner, what else could you model? Not another prediction, because I already used predicting. What other comprehension, word-solving, text structures, or text features could you model for your students on this paragraph? Now, I know if you teach seven-year-olds, you're not actually using this piece of text. That would seem inappropriate. I tried to choose something that might be interesting to you since we've been talking a lot about neurosciences this conference. So turn your heads. What could you model from this paragraph? There is no right answer to what you could model for your students. There's no right answer. Are there things in word solving you could do in this paragraph? Yes. Are there other comprehension strategies you could model? Yes. Questioning, summarizing, there's all kinds of things you could model. You could talk about text structure. This is a problem or a cause. There's going to be a solution or an effect coming because we understand how text works. There's no right answer of what to model. You model based on the surface learning your students need. If they are struggling with comprehension, you model more comprehension. If they are struggling with word solving, you model more word solving. So you figure out what is getting in their way that then you can model how you do it, thinking aloud for students. Now, I know there's some high school, middle school people here, so grades six and above. So I want to make a point for you all. I am an English teacher. That first sentence throws me off. Attend the tale sounds like a tall tale. For me, attend the tale of Paul Bunyan. For those of you who know theater, attend the tale of Sweeney Todd. Right? So there's this, why are we talking about a tall tale when the source was supposed to be accurate and true? It's making me think it's not true. But the source is supposed to be true. Now, that's an English teacher perspective on this. My guess is the history teachers did not do that. Did we invite any history social studies teachers in the room? We forgot to invite them? OK. OK. There's one history person. So at least who admits being a history teacher. The history teacher probably didn't pay attention to that first sentence. History teachers go immediately to 1848. They love a date, don't they? They love a setting. They love a time period. They love a location. Why? Because historians contextualize text. 
They put text in their historical context and they look for corroborating evidence. That's how historians think. Historians think differently from English critics. And if the history teachers don't model historical thinking, our students will never develop it. They will only hear what English teachers have to say about a piece of text. Are there any science teachers in the room? There we go, science teachers. So my guess is the science teachers didn't care about the first sentence, and they didn't care one thing about the date. Science teachers want a talk about the brain. <laughs> it went in here, it came out here, something important in between, what part of the brain got damaged, what happened when that brain got damaged. Scientists look for cause and effect relationships, and they look for bias. They want to know who wrote it, because they want to know if they trust that scientist. I didn't put the authors on here because the scientists immediately go, oh, they're the Damasios, well, a lot, right? So I don't want you to know that. My point here is, our disciplines come through when we model for students. It's how we apprentice them to disciplinary thinking. All of us need to model for students so they hear our thinking. Second paragraph. The rod landed several yards away, and Gage fell back in a convulsive heap. Yet a moment later, he stood up and spoke. His fellow workers watched a gasp, then drove him by ox cart to a hotel where a local doctor, one John Harlow, dressed his wounds. As Harlow stuck his index fingers in the holes in Gage's face and head until their tips met, the young man inquired when he would be able to return to work. So I'm thinking about that illustration there, and I'm really not appreciating this artist. I watched the session after mine and the amazing graphics that we got to see. This needs, they need to hire a new graphic artist for this. And here's what I'm thinking. It appears to me from this image that the rod got stuck in his head. But the words told me it went through, out, and landed. So if I were the artist, I really wish I could have an animation where you click it and the rod goes shooting through his head. And you could click it again and watch it again. And if I couldn't have animation, I would probably put an arrowhead on the top and maybe bend the line a little bit so my readers understood the, the rod was traveling through. It is not true that the top of his skull popped off. Do you see that? Not true. That's wrong. Now, why do I say that? because students who struggle to read pay more attention to the visual image and they have not been taught how to, crit to critique visual images. You have to think aloud those images as well. Now you can't talk about the image because I already did, but what might you model on the second paragraph for your students? You're allowed to change. If you did, if you did summarizing before, you're allowed to change. You can stay the same as well. What might you model on this second paragraph for your students? Turn and talk. Thank you. So again, we model based on what we know about our students and the learning they still need to do. I'll show you one more paragraph, <clears throat> then I'll leave this piece of text. Third paragraph, <clears throat> within two months, the physical organism that was Phineas Gage had completely recovered. He could walk, speak, and demonstrate normal awareness of his surroundings. But the character of the man did not survive the tamping rod's journey through his brain. In place of the diligent, dependable worker stood a foul-mouthed and ill-mannered liar given to extravagant schemes 
that were never followed through. Gage, said his friends, was no longer Gage. We're three paragraphs in, and I have a lot of questions in my mind. If I could message the author or call the author, I would like to know the following. Number one, how did Phineas survive a penetrating brain injury? I watched Narcos. Do you all know the show? I love Narcos. I know we're not in Colombia, but I watched Narcos, and they shoot a lot of people in the head, and they all die. How did this guy live? I want to know that. Number two, how much longer did he live? I have heard medical miracles 24 hours, and then the person passes. So please tell me how much longer. Did he have a natural life? Did he have a shortened life? Number three, what was the quality of his life? Because you told me he was foul-mouthed and ill-mannered. Did his family stay connected to him? Did he have friends? Did he get to keep his job? Could you turn to your partner and ask a question you hope the author answers next? If I could interrupt you there. During teacher modeling, students should have some opportunities to try things on with their partners. One of the mistakes I think we make is that teacher modeling is not a teacher monologue. Because it gets really, really, really boring after a while for students. They need to try things on. If I show you how I ask questions, turn to your partner and ask questions. If I make predictions, turn to your partner and make predictions. Allow students to try on things we are modeling for them. I was at a conference a couple of years ago, and I signed up for a session on students' attention spans. It would be convenient for me if my students had longer attention spans. Do you agree? Would it be more convenient for you if your students had longer attention spans? It would be great, right? So I went to the session by a psychologist, and in the first few minutes he said, there is no evidence that you can change a learner's attention span. I'm out. I'm leaving. I'm boring. I'm like, what am I doing here? And he said, your attention span is your age in minutes so if you take your age and you translate that to, that to minutes, that's your maximum attention span. Up to 10, because it never gets better than that. I teach 14-year-olds, so their attention span is a max of 10 minutes, according to this psychologist. He said it never gets better. The difference is in self-regulation that can be taught. Attention span cannot be taught, but self-regulation can be taught. Many of you have had things pop in your mind while I'm talking. It happens to all of us. We don't know why it happens, but we know where it happens. It happens in your thalamus of your brain. It's the signal uh, moderator that either allows things through or not. We don't know why it happens, but we know how it happens. We know where it happens. But most of you in this room have developed self-regulation, so when that thought came to you, did I lock the car? Who's picking up my kids? How was the soccer game today? You know, all those things you're worrying about. 
You have self-regulation so you can come back to the learning environment. A lot of your students don't yet have self-regulation. When they get to try something on with a partner and practice, they are very likely to come back to the learning situation. So they need to try things on on a regular basis. Make a couple of connections for you with this Phineas Gage, 1848. This injury happened in 2004 in California, Northern California. This man, construction worker, was on a ladder with a drill and a big drill bit. He fell and landed on the drill bit. You can see that. Here are his teeth. That is his eye socket. Awesome, right? He's alive and he's fine, but his personality changed. He's foul-mouthed. He's ill-mannered. He's a compulsive gambler, which he was not before the injury. So his personality changed from damaging this part of his body. If you are squeamish, the next picture is worse. Close your eyes. This guy is a construction worker. He is nail gunning a floor, big commercial property, nail gunning a floor. He loses one of the nails and finishes his whole shift for the rest of the day. And then six days later, six days later, goes to the dentist to complain of a toothache. And the dentist says, I think I know why you have a toothache. And Patrick is alive and fine other than his personality changed. He didn't go to the doctor because his executive functioning area, the very front part of his brain, had been damaged, so he didn't do anything about it. But when his teeth started hurting, his brain said, when your teeth hurt, go to the dentist. So he did six days later. Now, I tell you, why do I tell you these stories? We're at a teacher conference. Why are we looking at brains, right? It's super fun to be on this side of the room and watch you all. Some of you are like, oh, right? Some of you look to your person next to you like, right? Others of you are leaning forward in the chair, give me more, give me more, right? For the last eight minutes, almost every one of you has been all in this lesson. Whatever else was going on in your life, you pushed it apart, you pushed it aside, and you were thinking along with me. You were anticipating and predicting and connecting and visualizing and doing all those things good readers do. I probably cannot get you to do this for the next hour, but if I give you little bits of time in this and I practice with you, you will start to develop habits that you can use when I'm not there with you. That's powerful teacher modeling. It comes in very short doses, and then students get to go and work with their peers. They hear the thinking of a more expert person. Last connection, if you're interested in this story, there's a grade six book called Phineas Gage, a gruesome but true story about brain science. It won the International Nonfiction Award, Obus Pictus, a couple years ago. It is this awesome book of informational text about the human central nervous system told through the biography of Phineas Gage, probably the most important person to live in terms of medical history in the brain. In 1848, the whole world thought we used our whole brain for everything. It was whole brain theory. His injury proved to the world that there was localized brain function. And his physician created a new discipline in medicine that today we call neurology that did not exist before his injury. He died 13 years after the injury. He had a seizure one night and he died. His wife left him after six months. He wasn't a very nice man. He was unemployed the rest of his life. He couldn't hold a job. He lived in the state of Massachusetts in the United States, and he was voted out of two different towns during a town hall meeting. All in favor? You, out. I kind of want to bring that back. I have candidates in my country I would like to vote out. 
But it's sad for me because at that point in American history, we did not know how to accommodate people with behavioral differences, and our solution was to throw them out of town. And that's a sh of our history. But when he died, his doctor kept his skull, and when his doctor died, his doctor donated the, school to Har the skull to Harvard. You can still fly to Cambridge, Massachusetts. You can still go to Harvard Medical School's library to this day, and you can see his skull and the railroad rod that went through it. So hot that it perfectly cauterized all the way through. Because in 1848, you could survive the injury, but per not, probably not the infection. We didn't totally get germ theory. We did not have good antibiotics, and we did not have latex gloves. So John Harlow probably put dirty, unwashed, ungloved fingers in the holes until their tips met. And he didn't die from the infection because it had already been sealed. Pretty awesome story, right? Do you think you might have some students who would pay attention to you telling that story? That's what we need to find. Those six minutes, seven minute long glimpses into thinking so our students can apprentice at the surface level to the kind of thinking we're looking for. And then the rest of the hour, they can go interact, problem solve, and think more deeply. My, my plea to you, because I gave you two strategies, wide reading and teacher modeling, please do not hold any strategy in higher esteem than your students' learning. You're gonna learn a lot of strategies when you go to conferences. If it's not working for your students, change the strategy. First and foremost, it has to work for your students. We wanna do move, we do wanna move, sorry, to deep learning. We don't wanna leave our students at the surface level. Here are some of the tools we have to move students into deeper learning. These work provided that the learner already has some surface learning. I did not say two weeks of surface learning. I don't know your students to know how much surface learning they need, but our goal has to be to move them into deep learning. And my argument is, if we wanna move from surface to deep with our students, we have to change our strategies. The same strategies for surface will not work for deep. We have to change our behaviors. Deep learning approaches don't work any better for surface learning than surface learning approaches work for deep learning. Surface works for surf, surface, deep works for deep, and there's nothing wrong with that. One of the tools we have are graphic organizers. They work very well to force students to organize their thinking. Now, I stole a piece of paper from an audience member because I was not a completely prepared teacher today, and I left it at home in my hotel room, and I couldn't run up there in front of all of you. This is one of my favorite graphic organizers. We call it a discussion roundtable. So I took a piece of paper. Now, I'll use my language because this is how I was taught to do this. We fold it hot dog. Do any of you say that? You probably don't. It looks like a hot dog bun to us. This would be a hamburger bun. You call it whatever you want. Oh, by the way, we call this a tamale roll, and the long way is a burrito roll. It's just we have names, we call all the paper food. So anyway, you start folding it this way, we call that a hot dog fold, then you fold it hamburger fold, then you fold a triangle down. So when you open it up, and I wrote on it, super simple, right? The four of us are a group. We each are reading a piece of text we have in common. I've read it, my notes go here. My name's Doug, I put my name here, I put my notes in this quadrant. That's an independent task, I'm doing it by myself. When she talks, the other members of us in our group, we take notes in this quadrant as she talks. We put her name here and we take notes. When she talks, we put her name here, we take notes. When she talks, we put her name here, we take notes. Do you see the collaborative nature here? Do you see the individual accountability for this group task? And when we've all talked, each of us write our summary in the rhombus in the middle. Do you see the individual accountability here? So if I got all my students working collaboratively over there, now I can go meet with a small group who needs me over here, because I will have evidence of your learning even though I wasn't present in your group. I could have some of you doing independent, you could be at a makerspace, you could be reading something and taking notes like this. I can divide up all kinds of ways. 
We've, every speaker so far has talked about students' collaboration and students' dialogue and students' discussion. None of you are actually going to go do that in your classrooms unless you have ways to hold kids accountable for their learning. Because all of, here's my theory. All of you had group work gone wrong when you were in school. I bet everybody in this room worked in a group. Nobody else in the group did the work, but you did the work. And then 30 years later, you're bitter about that because it wasn't fair. So you say, I don't do group work in my class. And then they go to conferences. Yes, we should do group work. Group work's amazing. Kids learn a lot. Their language grows, all this stuff. But the back of your mind, you are saying, I did all the work for the group, and it wasn't fair. Try this. Super simple solution to hold each kid accountable. I'm not doing her work. She's not doing my work. But I am learning how to listen to another human being, even if I don't agree. I am learning to take notes as I listen to another human being. Individual accountability will change the implementation of collaborative learning. If we don't hold kids accountable for some of their collaborative learning, we're not going to see high levels of implementation. Another way you could do this super fast, give each student a big piece of poster paper, give them each a different color marker to write in. They can only write on the poster in that color, and they have to put their name in that color on the bottom. So when you walk by, you say, tell me what you wrote in red. Tell me what you wrote in green. You could hold them accountable that way. If we don't build individual accountability, we probably are not going to see high levels of collaboration. Graphic organizers are an intermediate step to something else. Please don't collect these and give kids points and grades for these. Graphic organizers are a tool to talk. They are a tool to write. They are a tool to plan research. They are a tool to plan a project. They're not the product itself. They're a step toward the product. We want to take students from surface to deep and then eventually to transfer. Transfer is our goal as teachers. We want students to be able to apply what they have learned in a variety of situations, not just the situation we taught them. The idea of transfer has been around a really long time. This is a quote from a book called Understanding by Design, a very famous book, UBD. It seems like a big part of the conference was drawing on that concept of design. And here are some strategies that have good evidence for transfer. And by the way, they don't work very well when you don't know anything. And I know lots of you are involved in problem-based learning, as am I. I work at a problem-based learning school. But if you don't know anything, it's very hard to solve the problem. One I would like to push with you, one comment I want to make about this. I wish we could create opportunities for students to tutor each other, their peers, within class and across class. Peer tutoring is one of the cheapest, most effective ways we can get to transfer. When you know something and you are teaching other people, you become very solid in your knowledge, very confident in your knowledge, and very capable. I wish we could reinvestigate, reinvigorate this concept of peer tutoring, but parents don't love it because they think you don't know what to do with the smart ones. So we no longer call it peer tutoring at our class, at our school. We're now calling it peer learning, and we're assigning students to cross age tutor each other to ensure transfer of their learning. So it's a journey. We go on from the surface to the deep to the transfer, and we have to change our instructional strategies in literacy if we want kids to go on that journey with us from surface to deep to transfer. For me, it's the right approach at the right time for the right kind of learning. And with that, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your conference.